<clears throat> Good morning, my beautiful friends. Check it out, guys. This is going to be episode 42 of an Old Testament three-piece. We have stories from 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and Jeremiah that we're going to look at today, so I can't wait to share those with you. But first, let's get into some prayer, all right, guys? Heavenly Father, we want to come before you today, Lord, so thankful and so appreciative for you being in our life, for you being our, our guiding light, our foundational truth, our spiritual and physical backbone as we as we navigate this fallen world in our own personal walks of faith. We ask that our hearts be opened up to you today, Lord, that we be receptive to the nourishment of these stories and the word that we are hopefully led into by them, Lord. We want to ask that this video be able to reach the eyes and ears of anyone out there who is not yet at the foot of the cross, anyone out there struggling with sin and hurt and addiction and a whole host of other things, Lord. Anyone out there who is backslidden from their place at the foot of the cross, Lord, that they could be revived and reinvigorated and, and, and drawn back in, away from that apostasy, away from that falling away, Lord, back into your arms, back into your loving truth, back into your good and guiding light. We want to pray for a hedge of protection around the lives of and a blood covering over the hearts and over the minds of children and the infirm and anyone unable to do so for themselves. Your love, your grace, and your mercy surround us every day, Lord. We are so blessed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we seek for our gratitude to become fuel for a more active and productive walk. We pray all of this in the righteous holy, loving, and, and infinitely good name of your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, guys, let's get into this. Again, this is episode 42. If you haven't followed along before, my name is Rex. Uh, Jesus Christ saved me from over 20 years of addiction and just a, a awful life of service to the flesh. Amen. Um, the idea behind these types of videos is we're going to be reading three Bible stories from Elsie Egermeyer's Bible story book published in 1922. Um, at the beginning of each story, we'll have the exact scriptures that these are based on. And the idea is if this story speaks to you, if you have the time, if you're just really driven to, to grow in the Word, I promise you when you spend honest, wholehearted time in Scripture, it is never a waste. You will always be rewarded with with a, a feeling of fullness, a feeling of truly being nourished, not just on the physical level, but on the on the on the level of spiritual, on the on the profound level. Amen. So that's what I would like you to do is to check out these scriptures on your own time. Get to know your Bible better back to front. We're never done learning. We're never done growing in the holy and living word of God. Guys, let's get into these. Come on now. Hey, by the way, go Bills Mafia, you know, I had to say it, guys. Let's get into this. All right, the good King Hezekiah pulled from 2 Kings chapters 18 to 20 and 2 Chronicles chapters 29 to 32. 2 Kings 18 to 20, 2 Chronicles 29 to 32. After the people of Israel were carried away into captivity by the king of Assyria, only the tribe of Judah remained of the 12 tribes that had entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. And Hezekiah was the king of Judah at that time. Now, the kingdom of Judah was very weak when Hezekiah took the throne. For many years it had been ruled by men who were not serving the true God, and they had even shut up the temple of the Lord. Hezekiah began at once to restore the true religion. He called for the priests and the Levites to come to Jerusalem to cleanse the temple. Then when everything was ready for worship at the house of God, he sent invitations to the people in every part of the land of Judah and Israel and commanded them to come to the feast of the Passover, which they had not kept for many long years. Some of the people, well, they only laughed when they received Hezekiah's invitation to attend the festival. They had worshipped idols for so long uh, at that time that they did not care to return to Jerusalem again. They did not care to worship the one true God. But many from the land of Judah came gladly, and there was a great meeting. Hezekiah destroyed the idols out of his land and tried to teach his people to do right. He found in Jerusalem the brass serpent that Moses had made in the wilderness. 
He saw that the people were burning incense before this brass serpent just as if it were an idol. So, he cast it into the fire. He tore down the altars that had been built to worship heathen gods and did much to strengthen his kingdom. Now, the king of Assyria had gained power over Judah before Hezekiah took the throne. Every year, the people of Judah had to pay Assyria a large sum of money, a tribute, if you will. But Hezekiah was displeased to have his people oppressed by this heathen king. And he decided to quit paying the money. He built up the walls of Jerusalem around until they were very strong. Then he gathered an army and made ready to fight against the Assyrians. But Hezekiah's army was only a handful compared to the host of Assyria. The enemies came into the land of Judah and took one city after another. Then they marched toward Jerusalem, and Hezekiah knew that his soldiers could not keep them away. He saw when too late that he had made a sad mistake when he refused to pay the money that the Assyrian king requires of his people. So he sent word to the angry king, promising to resist him no more and to pay whatever that king should require. Well... The king of Assyria thought, now is my chance to spoil this little country of Judah. So he demanded a heavier tax than he had ever asked before. And Hezekiah took all the gold and silver that was in his palace and all that he could find among the people. Hezekiah even took the gold and silver from the temple of the Lord to pay his tax. Still, the king of Assyria was not satisfied. He sent a message saying, I am going to destroy your city and I will take you and your people away to a far country, just as I have done to your neighbors who lived in Israel. The gods of other nations did not help them when I came against them and your God will not be able to save you. Hezekiah was afraid when he heard this message. He knew that his army was not strong enough to drive away such a powerful enemy. He took the letter that this king had written and went into the temple to pray. There he spread the letter before the altar and asked God to help him, to help his people out of their trouble. Then he sent some of his princes to visit the good prophet Isaiah and ask him to tell them about God's will. Isaiah answered, The Lord has said that the king of Assyria shall not come into this city nor shall he even shoot an arrow against it. But he shall go back to his own country by the way that he came, and there he shall be killed with a sword. That same night an angel of God visited the camp of the Assyrian king and caused a terrible sickness to fall upon the soldiers. By morning, many of them lay dead. All of the leaders in the army were among the dead men, and the king rose up and hastened back now to his own land. Never again did he return to fight against Hezekiah, for God had heard and God had answered the prayers of the good king. And years after this, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god in Nineveh, two of his own sons killed him. At one time, Hezekiah became very sick, and there was no cure to be found for his sickness. Isaiah, again the prophet, came to him and said, God has commanded that you get ready to leave this world, for you must die. Hezekiah did not feel that he could leave his people. He turned his face to the wall, and he prayed earnestly that God would make him well again. And then he wept bitter tears and reminded God how faithful he had tried to rule the people, and God heard Hezekiah's prayer. Isaiah was returning to his home when the Lord spoke to him again, saying, Go back to the king and tell him that I have heard his prayer and seen his tears, and now I will add fifteen years to his life. On the third day he shall be able to go up to the temple to worship. Hezekiah was glad to hear Isaiah's second message. He asked for a sign from the prophet, and Isaiah answered, The sign shall be according to your choice. Shall the, set, shall the shadow on the sundial go backward? Or shall it go forward ten degrees? The sundial was the instrument by which the kings might know the time of day, for there were no clocks as we have now. And Hezekiah asked that the shadow might go backward, as it would not seem like a sign for the shadow to move forward. So Isaiah prayed, and the shadow moved backward ten degrees. And Hezekiah was healed of his disease according to God's word, and he lived for fifteen years more. During that time, he built up his kingdom, and he became very rich. He grew proud of his riches, but God rebuked him, and he humbled his heart yet again. 
When he died, all the land mourned for him because they knew he had been the best king that Judah had ever known. All right, guys, let's get into our second story. The story about a forgotten book pulled from the pages of 2 Chronicles chapters 34 and 35. It was house cleaning time in the temple of the Lord. Many years had passed since this building had been repaired by the boy king, Joash. And during those long years, the temple had been much neglected. It had even been mistreated, for one king had set up altars for the idol of Baal right in the courts of the Lord's house. Now, that king was dead, and his grandson, Josiah, was ruling the people of Judah. And because of Josiah... And because Josiah was trying to do right, he had given the command that God's house should be repaired and made ready for the proper kind of worship. Many skillful workmen were hired to help repair the temple, and the heathen altars were torn out of the temple courts and carried outside the city, where they were burned with fire. While this work was going on, the high priest was setting things in order in the rooms of the temple, and there, hidden away beneath some rubbish, he found a strange book. This strange book proved to be the same one as Moses had written before he died. It was called the Book of the Law. For in it Moses had written the words of the law which God gave to the Israelites. And Moses had commanded that the book should be read in the hearing of all the people once every seven years. But now many years had passed by since the book had been read. And during those years, the book had been entirely forgotten. The high priest carefully removed the dust from this precious book and called for a servant of King Josiah. Shaphan, the servant, came quickly, and the high priest told him to carry the book to the king. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Now, Josiah had never heard the words of God's law before this time. He asked his servant to read aloud from the book, and Shaphan read about God's promise to bless the people that they should serve him faithfully. Then he continued to read, and Josiah heard about God's promise to punish the people if they should forsake him and turn to worship idols. Josiah was alarmed. He knew the people had disobeyed God's law, and he feared the awful punishments which God promised to send upon them. He tore his clothes, and he wept tears, bitter tears. Then he sent servants to a woman named Huldah, who was a prophetess to ask her about God's plan to punish the people for their great sins. Huldah told the servants that God would surely send all the great punishments upon the people, just as he had promised to do if they should forsake his law and worship idols. But because Josiah the king had humbled his heart and had wept tears of sorrow for their sins, Huldah said that God would not let the punishment come upon the land during his lifetime. Now, Josiah did not try to forget about the words of God's law. He wanted all his people to hear them too. So he called for a great meeting at Jerusalem. And when the people came together, he read to them from within the book. Then he promised God to keep that law and to serve God with all his heart. He commanded his people to keep the law too. And they obeyed their king. Afterwards, Josiah prepared to keep the Passover feast, which the Israelites were commanded in God's law to keep once every year. He assembled the people from every part of the land, and when they came together, he gave from his own flocks many lambs for the Passover supper. And the people rejoiced together and kept the feast for seven days. Not since the days of the prophet Samuel had there been such a great Passover feast as this one. Josiah ruled the people for 31 years. He began to rule when he was only a child of eight years old. Of course, some older men had charge of the important affairs of the kingdom until he grew into his manhood. But Josiah longed to be a good king when he was but a boy. And at the age of 16, he began to seek God earnestly, and God helped him to rule his people wisely. At the end of Josiah's good reign, the king of Egypt went out to fight against the Assyrian king, and he marched through the land of Judah. Josiah was not pleased to have him pass through the country, so he called out his army and prepared to fight against him. Now, the king of Egypt did not wish to fight against Josiah, and he sent word for Josiah to return home from the battlefield, but Josiah would not go. He dressed himself in the clothes of a common soldier, and he went out to battle anyway. And in the midst of the fight, he was shot by an archer and wounded so severely that his servants brought him back to Jerusalem in a chariot. Soon afterwards, he died, 
And the people buried him among the honorable kings of Judah. The prophet of God wept for him because he knew that Josiah was the last king who would ever try to keep the words that Moses wrote within the book of the law. Guys, let's get on to story three. Thank you so much for letting me share with you. God is so amazing. Check it out, guys. The weeping prophet and his great work pulled from... <laughs> might take you a while if you decide to read these scriptures. Pulled from Jeremiah chapter 1 to Jeremiah chapter 52, all right? It is a wonderful book. You're not going to waste time in it, that's for sure. But that's where it's from. Jeremiah 1 to Jeremiah 52. While Josiah was the king in Judah, God called a young man named Jeremiah to be a prophet. At first, Jeremiah thought he could never obey his call, for he was a shy young man. He was timid, meek. He told the Lord that he could not speak to the people because he was but a child. But God answered, Do not say you are only a child, for you must go to every person to whom I send you, and you must tell them every word I bid you. Then the Lord touched Jeremiah's mouth and said, I have put my words in your mouth, and I have set you over the nation to do a great work for me. Jeremiah was no longer afraid to obey when God promised to be with him and to help him out of his troubles. For Jeremiah knew he would have many troubles. He knew how the prophets before him had been treated oh so cruelly, simply because they dared to speak God's words to the sinful people. He knew that he as well may have to suffer many things. While Josiah was king in Judah, Jeremiah was treated kindly. But after Josiah died, the people soon turned back to idol worship again. They did not care for the true God, and they refused to listen to his faithful prophet. The king of Egypt took their new king away as a prisoner and made them pay great sums of money every year. Then he placed another of Josiah's sons upon the throne of Judah. <coughs> I apologize, God. You know, if I knew how to edit, you wouldn't have to hear those calls. <clears throat> now, Josiah's sons were not good men like their father. They forsook God and allowed idols to be set up all through the land. They even treated God's prophet unkindly because he warned them about the dangers that God would send upon them as punishments for their sins. One day, Jeremiah told his dear friend Baruch the words that God spoke to him, and Baruch wrote the words in a book. Then he took the book and went out to read it among the people. Soon... The princes of Judah heard about it, and they called for Baruch and asked him to read to them. They were frightened when they heard what Baruch had written, for they believed God's words, and they knew their land would soon be taken away from them. They asked Baruch to let them have the book to read to the king, but first they told Baruch to hide himself in Jeremiah, lest the king be angry when he heard the words of God and try to punish them for putting the words into the book. Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, was the king at that time. He was sitting in his palace when the princes came to him, bringing the books that, Banu, that Baruch had written. And he listened while they read. But as soon as they finished reading a page, he called for the book and took his penknife and cut the page out. Then he threw it into the fire. This he did with every page that Baruch had written. He would not believe the words of the Lord, and he wanted to punish Jeremiah and his friend, but he could not find them. The princes sent word to Jeremiah and Baruch, telling them how the king had treated the book, and once more the prophet and his friend wrote down the words of God. And the words that they wrote were true, for not long afterwards a great king from the east country of Chaldea came and took some of the people away to Babylon, and Jehoiakim was placed in a prison house and kept as a prisoner for many years. But Jeremiah's troubles were by no means ended. After the reign of Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, who had reigned just a little over three months, a new king, Zedekiah, another son of the wicked Jehoiakim, was soon ruling the people of Judah, and he was more wicked than his father had been. He caused Jeremiah to be cast into a prison house because he spoke the words of God. And the men who put him into the prison tied ropes about his waist and lowered him into a deep hole beneath the prison floor. Such a hole today we would maybe call a dungeon, and there the prophet was kept for some time. In the darkness and the dreariness of the dungeon, Jeremiah was very unhappy. He had no comfortable place to rest, and he had only dry bread and water to eat and drink day after day. 
While this trouble was happening to Jeremiah, the people of Jerusalem were also in distress. The king of Babylon had come yet again with a strong army and was camping around the walls of their city. They could not go away, and none of their friends could come to help them, and their food supply was growing smaller, dwindling day after day. Soon, they would have nothing left to eat. The king of Judah was afraid of this army outside his city. He called for Jeremiah to tell him what to do, so the men let ropes down into the dungeon and pulled the prophet out again to send him to the king. And Jeremiah told the king that God was going to allow the army to capture that city. He was going to allow that army to break down its walls, and he was going to allow that army to even destroy the beautiful temple of the Lord. But he said that God would not let the Chaldean king, Nebuchadnezzar, kill the people of Jerusalem if they would willingly offer themselves to become his prisoners. Then they would not need to starve to death inside of the city. Guys, that is such a portion of the story to really ponder on and pray on. There's so much fruit there, right? Let's move on. Jeremiah asked the king not to send him back into that dark dungeon again, so afterwards he was kept in the court of the prison and treated more kindly, but he was not allowed to go about through the city or talk to the people. The people of Jerusalem and their king were not willing to give themselves up as prisoners to Nebuchadnezzar, as Jeremiah had told them to do. So, weary months passed by. They stayed inside the walls of Jerusalem, and they suffered from hunger and thirst. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah suffered with them, for he could not escape. At last, when all the food was gone, the king decided to slip away from Jerusalem during the night. He thought the Chaldean army and King Nebuchadnezzar might not see him. But King Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry, but King Zedekiah had not gone far from the city when he was captured by his enemies, the Chaldeans. They put heavy chains on his hands and feet and then put out his eyes and led him away to Babylon. Many of the people of Judah were taken with him and only a few of the poorer people were left in the land. Nebuchadnezzar and his army broke down the walls of Jerusalem and set fire to the temple of the Lord. They first took out all the vessels of gold and silver that they found in the temple and they carried these precious vessels back to their own land. Jeremiah was allowed to remain in the land of Judah among the poorer people, and he lived to be an old man. But as long as he lived, he faithfully warned the people according to all the words that God spoke to him. Because he lived during such a time of trouble, Jeremiah was often a sad-faced man. He talked more about the sorrows of his people than about their joys. And often he wept because of their sins. For this reason... And to this day, he was called and is now known as the Weeping Prophet. Amen, guys. What a beautiful set of stories. Really hope you guys enjoyed those. Um, can't wait to share some more with you next week. Hey, if, if you like that, or if you were even just willing to put up with it, come on now, hit that subscribe button, give that bell icon a tap, you'll get notified every time I drop a new video. Three long format and a brand new YouTube uh, short every single morning. Ten videos every week on this channel. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you liked it. That really helps to drive engagement and further the reach of this content. If it helps you, help me out so we can help more people out with the Word of God. Amen. Um, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, video ideas, drop them in the comment section. Prayer requests, drop it in the comment section. Testimony to the goodness of God, drop it in the comment section. Guys, I love you. Father God loves you even more, man. Whatever you're going to do, go out there. Be bold in your faith. Be bold in the eternal and assured hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And remember, the devil is out there roaming about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if he's going at it nonstop, if he's going at it all in... We got to be ready to get it for God, guys. I'll see you in the next one.